excited to see everyone. Let's go underground. And the first question is, will I be okay? Hello adults. Yes, it's me, the future. I am sad and I am scared. Will the world be better when I grow up? Will I be okay? We already saw through um, many of the systemic uh, inequities that have existed in our country for, for decades, the disparity between um, uh, low, low income people and those who are in um, average or higher income brackets. The academic disparity was already there. Now you add COVID to the mix and you have uh, children trying to learn from home and children who may not be as well nourished or as uh, emotionally and physically as they should be. And so we're really anticipating what, what educators are calling a COVID slide, where the trajectory is going to continue to go down uh, much longer than we would uh, hope uh, once uh, financial supports are back in place and schools are open. Uh, I think we should all anticipate that our customers and our children are going to continue to be um, kind of digging themselves out for a long time to come. And where I see the greatest stress right now is with mothers. Um, there's sort of this uh, uh, very uh, unfortunate intersection between you know, loss of work. I think we've lost over a million women in the workplace since the onset of COVID, uh, primarily because women often serve as the primary caregivers. and if school is not in session, then somebody has to stay at home to take care of the children. So with moms being at home, being isolated, having less money, sometimes they are heads of household, and they're having to try to uh, manage their kids and their own educational needs as well, as well as their own, they are really, really in bad shape. And I spoke to some of the um, administrators of our Head Start programs here in Madison. Um, this is a program, federally funded program, as you may know, that supports uh, families uh, with children living in poverty or um, at the poverty line. And basically the, the message we're hearing is, I'm barely able to survive. So I see credit unions playing this incredible role in responding to the needs of uh, groups that have often been marginalized by other financial institutions. And I know that teachers, because they're frontline responders to these families, are feeling a lot of compassion fatigue because they're hearing these very gut-wrenching stories from families and there's only so much they can do. And I'm certain that, you know, as financial providers, your staff are also on the front lines getting uh, information from people who are really in crisis. So um, I applaud you for trying to support your employees as they're responding to the needs of others. But I think we should be mindful that this is going to take a very, very long time for us to get back to some sense of normality or a, a sense of security, people feeling secure about their health and well-being. But I'm on this fantasy that we can actually eliminate poverty. Now, don't laugh. Don't laugh. You know, I've had enough people laugh at me about that already. But we want to do something that's evolutionary, revolutionary, sustainable, and scalable about helping to mitigate in the generational stubborn poverty that grips households and communities. And we're going to, and we're chipping away at it. And it's a complex equation with so many different factors involved in it. We probably can't do it all by ourselves, but by golly, it just feels like we should do more than just sit here and look at the problem and do nothing about it. So. We've got some ideas, we're working on some things, we have some theories, we're investing some money, but we wanna do something about poverty and that's, that's a big initiative for us this year.
And in 2021, with our partnership with the city of San Diego, um, we are working with them on small businesses, um, providing assistance to small businesses in the promise zone. So in the promise zone here in San Diego, it's, it's uh, a six, I think it's 6.7 square miles of our um, it's low income communities in, in San Diego, primarily communities of color. And so we are working with them on, you know, how to help the business community in that promise zone. Um, we're sort of, you know, still working on the, on the details. You know, originally we were looking at uh, like storefront development, making sure that they had the funds to um, make sure their storefront was um, attractive, up to date, safe, all of the things that, you know, business, you don't think about it, but the storefront of a business is important. And especially in low income communities. Um, that was one idea we're working on, but we're working on several things with the city of San Diego to do it. This is not just a one and done for us. It's, it's again, who we are, um, very, very important. It's just a really short story about standing up. There was a conference I was at, it was many years ago. Um, it was a business development and marketing conference. And the speaker uh, started talking about gay marriage. And he said, you know, and if it disgusts you, like it disgusts me, and no, 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 no. And I'm like, looking around, I said, did I just hear that correctly? And I did. And rather than saying something, I just got up and walked out. Um, but I thought to myself, I should have stood up and, and say something. But I, I did bring it to the attention of the, um, the organizers um, of the conference. And, um, he, the speaker did apologize to me afterwards, but that's one of those things where if I would, could do something differently and uh, you know, take a stand, then and there I would have. And as I said, we started to think about what can the larger credit union community do? What can we do collaboratively, collectively to uplift the community that you know, perhaps individual credit unions can't do individually. And, and we came up with a roster of four or five things. And uh, I, I happened to, to mention one of these during a, a, a panel discussion at uh, the AAC, the African American Credit Union Coalition uh, uh, National Conference. And I'm, an, I, I'm the, the new freshman backbencher on that board. So, yeah, and it's such a terrific board with such you know terrific committed people. Um, but I, I mentioned a couple of them, and including this this notion of creating a de novo credit union to serve historically black colleges and universities, um, their faculty, staff, students, and alumni, as, re as well as the residents and small businesses in the community surrounding the campus. Threw it out as something as, hey, wouldn't this be cool? And you know the response that that, that I received immediately following that has been overwhelming. Uh, re responses from you know lions of the industry, uh, uh, those from natural person credit unions, corporate credit unions, vendors, uh, trade associations, and, and even regulators. You know, raising their hand and saying. You know, this is something that we as a system, we as a credit union community can do. Yep, no one's going to get rich, no one's going to make money, but it's going to demonstrate the credit union commitment and, and the credit union passion for doing good and doing right for people that need us most. And I think we, we cultivate trust by really, um, I would say, just listening to, to, to one another and, and again, showing that empathy and giving a little bit of grace um, so that, you know, it's, it's not all, and it really, you know, it, 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 it has the power to transform lives. If we really believe on it, it's not just this, this, this kumbaya, it's like your own life. At the end of this story, when you're sitting in, a, in your deathbed, you can ask yourself, you know, did, was I able to, to transform somebody's lives? You know, did I leave this place better than I found it? You know, in terms of family and, and, you know, part of the reason why I love this, this work so much is because, you know, I, every day I get a chance to live my 
my footprint or my fingerprint on the work that hopefully one day somebody will say, you know what, if that hadn't happened, we wouldn't have this today. Ah, muy bien. Yo soy una cooperativa. Credit unions were the original social networks. I, I know I've heard you say that before. I've heard other people say it. This is our time. People helping people. We have a real opportunity to lead during this time of change. I love the, the industry's commitment to change. Uh, we're a part of that. I know you're a part of that. Your organization is a part of that. And you personally are a part of that. And um, now is our time. I love the idea that Maurice Smith had and the CUNA has supported for the eighth cooperative principle. Uh, we want to be a part of that, the schools first. Uh, we should re really be leading uh, how we help our members and our team members through this time of incredible change. And what an opportunity to break down barriers of, of racism and create opportunities for all of our members, regardless of their uh, background or race or color or religion or whatever the case may be, ethnicity. Um, we should be leaders. And uh, I, I've been saying for 30 years, there's never been a better time to, to be a credit union, but I believe it now more than ever. Um, let's be the change, uh, not just lead the change. Hello, Underground. My name is Brandi Stankovic. I'm the Chief Operations Officer and Chief Strategy Officer for CU Solutions Group, and I will be your MC for today's collision. So thank you all for being here. I'm very thankful. Thank you to M MSA for having me here with you today. And if you are here and ready to be part of the change, as Bill Cheney just described for us, then we encourage you to engage, as always. I wish that we could be together right now, whether it's for the GAC or or other opportunities to network and build relationships. But this is our chance to be together and be engaged with one another right now here today. So ways to do that, of course, chat window. You guys did, in the chat, you guys are already doing that. Let's keep continue to do that. We are going to break into some groups and we'll have opportunity to do that here just very soon and talk about these discussions today. As well as we're going to have some poll questions and get your feedback and thoughts on everything that we're talking about and the, the questions that are amazing uh, thought leaders and speakers are bringing up. So thank you to Jamie and Maurice and Todd uh, and Alex and Gary, Edgar and Bill for starting these discussions today around will I be okay and around the divide. So based on those discussions, I'm going to pose the first poll question. So you're going to see it pop up on your screen here very soon. What keeps you up at night? Go ahead and click your answer. And we'll start seeing some results there pop up. But as those results come in, I would like to bring back to the spotlight the founder, the assimilator, the innovator of the underground, Susan Mitchell. Wow. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on the Underground. Thank you, Brandy. I um, always appreciate the fact that you're an MC that can bring it out. So here we are. I'm Sue Mitchell. For those of you that this is the first time, I'm the CEO of Mitchell Stankovic and Associates. We're an executive consulting firm, and we've been working with credit units for more than 25 years. And we're the creators of the underground. And why? Because we believe that people need to speak up. We need to have the conversations that we used to have off stage, or we used to have on napkins, um, at the water cooler. These are all conversations that need to take place to keep the vulnerable collaboration going forward. So we wanna create an intimate environment because society needs credit unions. So today we're gonna to not only be talking about what, um, will I be okay, but we're gonna be looking at the facts. We're gonna be looking at how consumers are really doing today. And then we're gonna talk about the business purpose of what we can do about it. For all of us, 2020 was a year of incredible disruption. But there was also hope. Underground thought leaders became stronger and bolder in using their voices, responding to unprecedented changes in society. 
Last year in DC, we talked about Maslow's hierarchy and we talked about how life changes will impact the way we serve each other and our members. And then bam, we went home to the, the greatest change, the greatest disruption, certainly in my lifetime. During that time, we started to put ideas into action and we started to use phrases that people would believe in. We talked about the fact that like it's important to love and belong. It's important to reach out, talk to each other. Let's use phrases like modernizing board governance. Doing the right thing is also good business. CEU Pride is a new initiative that is, is going to blast onto the scene and bring people together and continue to connect. So be sure to check it out. And as you go to the forward, as you go forward, remember that shift is gonna happen. So here we are, not at the Hay Adams, we're in our homes, we're in our communities, we're in our offices, and we're trying to stay safe, healthy, some of us have noted that you've also been getting shots. So I'm hoping that we're gonna be in a place to get together soon. So it's 2021, a new year, a new beginning. And then we realize that we're still working through the last couple of years and we may be for some time as Jamie mentioned. So, Shift is gonna happen. So over the last 30 days, we reached out to the incredible speakers that you're gonna hear from today. And what you're hearing are snippets from 30 minute underground chats that are available that you can go and learn more. So there are three segments today. One you've just heard, will society, will I be okay? Does anyone care? And we know credit unions care, so we're gonna hear from them. And then what blinding flashes of the obvious have been right in front of our eyes that we have seen and implemented and made a difference this year. So mindful answers and amazing thought leadership. So after the three facilities, we're gonna to go to a fast break collaboration and then we're gonna keep it going. So Brandy, tell us what the polls had to say. Yes, let's head out and see those poll results from Zach. If you pop it up, it looks like serving the underserved ended up being at the top, but it, our financial viability right there, right behind, pretty equal, and DEI is top of mind. I was looking in the chat window as well as people are sharing their thoughts. It seems as if DEI is on everybody's mind as we move through the next year. But again, every single topic that we put out there is something that's important to all of us and that we're seeing a lot of response and a lot of people saying, hey, this is, this is something that's top of mind for us. So let's uh, continue to dig in. One of the things that really stuck with me is when Maurice Smith said, an evolutionary, revolutionary, sustainable and scalable, taking poverty in the example that he was talking about and all of these different ideas that we're talking about and doing, taking action, doing something about it and turning dreams into realities. And so let's hear from our subject matter experts now and thought leaders in the realm of human well-being and ask the question, does anyone care? Hello, humans. I am worried. There are moments that are good and times when they are bad. Will my family be okay? Will I be okay? Does anyone care? When I was getting prepared to talk about this, I was doing some reading and what I came upon was awful news that with people who are severely financially stressed, they are 20 times more likely to take their own life than somebody who is not financially stressed. So this is a real issue that goes beyond money. Debt for some reason has become a death sentence in America and people are really feeling it. 
And I think credit unions, this is a perfect time to step up and say, no, you are not your debt. You are, you, you are separate from that. We can help you get out of debt. Here's how, um, because these are human lives. We hear right now those stories in the news about a young man who misunderstood how Robinhood trading worked. And he was trading you know, options and thought he made a mistake and, and thought he owed a lot, a lot of money and he didn't, but in the meantime, he, he killed himself, you know? And so this is, money is real, the way it hits people. And it's not just, oh, we're here to help them with their money. Money is life in America. Money's access, money's power, all of these things. And we give our members agency when we help them learn how to use it and empower themselves. And, you know, and on, on terms of, of, of equity and, and that sort of thing, financial equality is going to bring about racial equality. It's the way it's going to happen, you know, where we have to, to make that line. So credit unions, again, on the front line of social change if we embrace it. And the first way and the biggest way we saw that we could help individuals was through the promotion of um, our employee assistance program. Um, and so EAP industry averages pre-2020 were right around 3%. And that's where we were coming into it. And to put this into perspective with the background of the pandemic and the unrest that we saw in 2020, our average, our utilization average went to 62%. So um, people, the stigma is gone. People are using it, and if there wasn't all these issues, that number would scare me to death. But um, I think it's a wonderful thing that people are tapping into and getting the help that they need. I've used the EAP um, for the first time. I was one of those people who thought, I'll never need to use the EAP, you know, everything will be fine. And I found it tremendously useful. We need to keep listening. We need to keep, not just listen, but ask, what do people need? And with the backdrop of everything that's going on, because everybody's dealing with it differently. We can't just assume all of our employees are going, or all people in general are going through this in the same manner and having the same issues that impact them. So we need to keep listening. We have to ask and draw it out, understand what their situation might be, and ask ourselves, what can we do to help? We launched our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council last year, and last February, in fact, and they have been amazing in terms of, you know, helping us think through everything from, you know, our employee handbook and the use of pronouns all the way to, you know, really kind of who we want to be in terms of a company and how are we making sure that we are tapping into our networks. You know, it's been uh, an evolution, uh, but I think in terms of education, awareness, and programming, uh, we are doing our best to make sure that we are offering an inclusive work environment that ultimately supports our goal of being that employer of choice. So a lot of really good work that I think uh, our council is doing and continues to do uh, to make sure that we are staying on top and being the uh, employer we want to be. We also leveraged our internal culture crew, uh, which is a group of employees that is chartered to really help us identify those opportunities that we have to impact our culture positively. And so, you know, through those organizations, to, through those employee-driven groups, we were able to meet the moment. I think my learning for last year was really that we as co-op had an opportunity to, you know, uh, appreciate how outside events impact us internally. Sometimes we like to think that, you know, there are very thick boundaries between what happens at work and what happens on the outside. How do we talk to employees about what's happening in the world and what we believe as co-op? And I think our CEO, Todd Clark, has done a wonderful job of really stating that. Um, Todd does uh, Todd Talks once a week, uh, and it's a video clip, it might be five minutes, but he talks about you know, what's top of mind for him, whether it's recognition of what's going on in the business, whether it's employee recognition, whether it's just awareness and update and his thoughts. And I think that too makes an impact on how they view uh, what is happening inside co-op as well as outside. So I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that as well. 
Well, it's certainly in terms of the good, it's in, you just cannot avoid talking about the pandemic. And you see in the good what credit unions have done uh, for their members and for their communities over the last 10 months. It, you know, the trade associations have certainly compiled all the PPP numbers and the emergency loans and some of the other steps. But what is less well known and frankly will never be documented is really though some of the good, the small things that credit unions have done in their offices and with their branches to help out members those stories that will never really be told, but they're just the small things that are the difference between someone, you know, make, keeping the rent in the place they live and perhaps being evicted. Um, so those are, are, that's the overarching good uh, that many credit unions have done. Um, secondly, you would certainly have to look at uh, the good work they've done maintaining most of their employment and their staffing levels. Been very easy to, uh, especially if you are a for-profit, to simply say, look, branch staff, we don't need you. We're, we're furloughing you. Uh, good luck. Here's how you fill out an unemployment form. Uh, but for the most part, credit unions have been able to maintain staffing levels by redeploying people. So that's certainly a positive. And I think uh, the final good is that some of that has been recognized uh, nationally, although there's been so much competing news, you know, it's, it's difficult to uh, really differentiate that. I'd like to say it's a tale of, of two sides of the coin. You know, one, one side, you know, we, we had a great year. We, we did really well. Um, we, we had record-breaking mortgage originations, uh, as an example. And a lot of that was driven by, by where we are. You know, people are moving out of the city. So even purchases uh, uh, took off in 2020. Um, we had refinances, obviously, because of the interest rate environment. Um, so that was all a great thing. Um, we, we, lending, lending was just up in, in general. Think about PPP alone. Uh, we did a lot, you know, for over a very short period of time, uh, to help our small businesses out. And, and so those things really went well. Now you turn the coin over and probably 25, 30% of our members are hurting. I mean, they're, they're out of business. They're out of work. Um, so we did, uh, we did a pivot there, you know, to make sure that we're paying attention to them and, and doing the loan deferrals that they needed. And uh, we even shifted our, our foundation to uh, support the food banks because, you know, people are literally starving to death. And that's, uh, that's a sad statement, you know, considering, you know, three quarters of the population is doing okay. And then the rest of them are really hurting. So I think that's, that's why we're in, in the business that we're in, the credit union business. But you know, to see that um, uh, that those two sides is is uh, very unusual. You're usually up or down. It's never never both at the same time. Now, well-being is much much different than than wellness. You know, all of us I think have been working on wellness with our members over the years, and that's you know teaching them how to how to budget their money and and uh, and do the right things with all that their investments and whatnot. Um, but what we found out that, you know, there's, there's a, a whole well-being is, is how, do, how do you feel and how do our members feel? You know, we have, we have people that are struggling right through thriving, and it has nothing to do with their income levels or how much uh, um, their family makes and whatnot. Um, and so how do we go back after that and, and really turn our brand into um, uh, serving our mission, which is to improve our members' lives and the communities we serve? And, and do that in a way that they feel good about um, how we help them manage their money, but in more importantly, what they do with their money. So, you know, it's all about member behavior and our behavior is I, I saved my money so I could um, provide my kids education or to, uh, so I could retire or so I could take a vacation. Well, when, when you feel good about those kind of things, then your well-being improves. And I think that's something that we, we really feel good about. The members are feeling good about it. So I'm gonna circle back to what I just said. Our, our branches are now, are, are now outbound calling centers. So when the pandemic took up um, in February, March, we started calling the members because they weren't coming in and just asking them, how are you doing? How are you feeling? How do we help you? And they go, why are you calling me? We said, just to, just to do that. We wanted to see how you're doing. I can't tell you how many compliments that we got from our members that said, Thank you for checking on us. And, and that's all well-being is. But think about it. We're not providing just financial services, which is a huge commodity, right? We're, we're providing something that means something to them. And so we're, are they going to look to come back and do more business with us? Well, hopefully, yes. But more importantly, do they feel good about their financial system, which you know, has been, been very difficult? We, 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 hate, we love to hate it as, as you, know, you think about it. 
we, we, you know, we talked about this notion that as, as a credit union, as a cooperative family, as a community, that we should care about one another. I mean, it's just, that's just basic decency. But it also presents a competitive advantage for us as a co-op to share with our membership that just peddling products isn't what we are, we are about. That their concerns, their wherewithal, and their livelihoods, if you will, is part of our responsibility as a co-op. And so one of the things we try to express among our team here and among our board and the membership is that it is insufficient for the credit union as a corporation to do well in a season and the membership suffers. So, you know, perhaps I'm a bleeding heart, Susan, I don't know. I, 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 I tend to take these things personal. And so we put this chip on our own shoulders that if our members in the community are struggling, then we dare believe it is our responsibility as their credit union to do something about it. So I am held responsible, not just for the bottom line, return on assets and net worth and the, the usual metrics for the credit union's performance, I also hold it as a personal responsibility that we ensure that our members in their communities are doing well. But, and that requires have a listening ear to what their concerns are and also being sensitive enough to react to the responses that we receive from our members. I really think the only difference that credit unions really have is our purpose. And our purpose should be the mission of financial health. There are things we can do and will do that others will not. And if you set up a structure to fulfill that aspect of your mission, I think amazing things happen for individuals and then amazing things happen for communities. And the closer we stick to that differentiation, I think the better off as an industry we are, but the better off as community pillars we will be in, in serving the members in, the, in our communities. I will tell you last year, um, in the last 20 years, we had the highest membership growth rate we ever had. I can't figure it out, to be honest with you, because it was not indirect lending, but we grew over 8.5% membership. And every year for the last five years, our membership growth has been picking up to hit about 8.5% in 2020. I read industry articles that said credit unions dropped from an average of 3% down to like 1%. I think um, some of the economists were, were indicating that. And yet our membership was going up and up. Our biggest membership growth is member referrals. And I believe we only have that because of our attention to mission performance. There are so many incredible points there from all of those speakers. Thank you, Cynthia, Brad, Cheryl, Frank, John, Maurice, and Aaron, and Allison for being the voice of reason at the beginning. We have another opportunity here for all of you to give your thoughts in a poll. So I invite everyone to respond to the question as it pops up on your screen. What are your top priorities here in the year ahead? And uh, I just that that there's so many thoughts provoking things that are happening is as we hear the thoughts from the speakers and the questions that they're asking and the emotions that they're invoking and it's just an interesting time for us in this movement for all of you that have been part of the movement for as long as you have and how much we care about credians and our members and while you're answering this poll, uh, I'd like now to invite Zach Christensen to the front of the room, to the spotlight from behind the scenes, to the front of the room. Hello, Zach. Hi, how are you? I don't know that I can spotlight myself as the host, just so you know. So, um, but thank you. And, and I think 
really for me, the top priority has been uh, the discussions about whole member well-being. And if, if you're really listening to the comments from the thought leaders, you'll pick up on pieces of that throughout each one of them and, and you will through this last segment as well. I think Aaron said it best is that credit unions do uh, and will do things that other people won't. And so from, whether it's ending poverty, like Maurice said, or it's just calling members to make sure that they were okay during the COVID piece, I, I believe that the credit unions are the difference for that. And that will add to the relevancy that we were seeing in the chat and uh, you know, financial viability into the future. If we stay true to our mission for that, uh, credit unions have nowhere else to go but up. Well, very well said, Mr. Christensen. It's, it, I feel like you should come from behind the, uh, the curtain here more often and say hello to everyone. We're seeing that in the chat as well. People saying, well, there's Zach. He's normally our voice of God and handling all things uh, digital and, and communications for Mitchell Stankovic. So thank you for sharing your thoughts on priorities with credit unions. So what did our credit union, what did everybody in the underground here say? What was the poll results? It looks like they're right there with you, Zach, and that member wellness is there up at the top and that we're, all of us are thinking about what that means. And that may play into community outreach and it may play into our digital strategies and our employee engagement as well. And financial growth, of course, is going to be on all of our minds as far as staying viable, staying healthy, being able to serve our membership because without which we cannot serve, right? But what's happening in the lives of our members? There's, there was so much noise in 2020. Now, some of it was much needed to cause uh, the social movements that we had um, that, you know, that we want to, to um, essentially, that, that there was, there was so much that was needed for the social injustice and social urgency that was created. So that some of the noise was needed, but there was some of it that was exhausting, like the political divide. And there was some of it that was horrifying, like the impact of the pandemic, whether economic or health or families. And the, the small things that credians were doing, like Frank Diekman described for us, whether it was maintaining the employees or helping in a time of need. I loved even how the examples that John Fenton described about reaching out to membership. And, and of course, with Maurice of just us pushing and, and it is our responsibility to make change and to support our membership. So let's use that and move into our final segment and uh, before we then lead some discussions and talk about the BFO. What are those blinding flash of the obvious? Hello friends. Yes, it's me. Say my name. I am hope. Out of the darkness, there can be light. I believe we can make change happen as it's right in front of our eyes. Let's keep up the good fight. You know, credit unions have overcome so much adversity over the years. And, you know, I just think it's amazing. Um, I didn't start in the credit union industry. I came from consulting world and, um, you know, never thought I would, I would end up in credit union. It's, you know, I hear that story from so many people. Um, but, you know, once you get bitten with the Kool-Aid bug, as they say, um, it's just amazing how you get to do this work. And so I would just say, you know, let's keep up the good fight because we've been here and, and let's continue to stay here and do our, and do great work in the community. So. But I would like for the industry, number one, to accept that disruption is on the way. Maybe it's a technology, maybe it's a fancy competitor, maybe it's a change in regulations, Maybe it's a social sh shift in how our society thinks about financial services and us. But I believe that, that disruption is on the way. That when, a, when an industry or a company gets so complacent to believe that we've arrived and there's nothing to strive for philosophically, then that, that, that kind of hubris usually leads to a downturn. 
So, so now if, if we as an industry said, wait a minute, we should look over our shoulders a little bit and think disruption is on the way. How do we prepare ourselves for it? And I think the way that we prepare ourselves for it is to keep digging our heels in deeper to figure out how to serve the membership. It's all about the members and it's all about the, the collective, you know, cooperative, you know, values that stitch us all together. And so, so that's, that's a nugget I would like to have the movement keep present in front of mind is that, you know, what we have today can be disrupted and we should not become complacent. I think that this year um, uh, opened a lot of eyes that, that have kind of said, yeah, yeah, we're doing some things on tech. Yeah, yeah, we're getting a new system, you know, you know, buying a new digital banking system or a new app or a chat bot or whatever, that's not digital transformation. You know, it's not a tool that you buy and then you're there. And, and because we've had kind of times of plenty over the last decade, it really lulls people into a false sense of security that, hey, you know, it must be do what I'm doing must be working, right? I'm, I'm doing okay. I think that 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 this uh, the pandemic and the new kind of realities of digital is really a wake up call, and that you're gonna that people are gonna if they're hoping that ultimately it goes back to how it was and that's what they're banking on to to not change, they're in for a world of hurt. So I would say, adapt or die. I think the other big thing that I see a huge advantage in in this, um, you know, we used to do quarterly senior management, or uh, uh, yeah, senior management team meetings. We had all of our vice presidents and above, about 40 people. Uh, they're, all, they're all over the country, fly them in, do a two-day meeting, cost a fortune, right? I mean, I'm doing them now, uh, well, for a while there, we were doing them you know, weekly. Now we're doing them, I think, every two weeks, our senior management team meetings, all virtually, all, you know, I think we're more connected today than we've ever been because of uh, how, we give the floor to different people. We give them a, a time to talk. You could never have done that, even in these two-day meetings. There was just too much to talk about. We, you know, they, there wasn't, you know, there was the sidebars. I think that are still valuable in that, you know, that with that personal interaction. But, but these uh, being able to have a uh, a Zoom call with forty people on it, and to be able to cover the kind of material that we cover to really keep everybody connected has really been a valuable thing. And I think. You know, we're never going to, you know, we'll, we'll have some in-person meetings, but very few compared to what we did have. First, the human data science is the concept that, the concept that we pioneered. Uh, human data science is the idea of using data owned, controlled, and created by the human individual that is what really tells the story, right? Data that's not subject to any uh, protected group status, nor data that anyone has the franchise on, nor is disenfranchised from. Data that every human being, every human being on the planet possesses just in different ratios. So data that by its nature is immune to disparate impact. Obviously that doesn't include historical transactional or relational approaches, which is really big data solutions. So the idea here is to build a foundation. What I say when I'm sitting down with a credit and I say, look, test it, try it, whether it's us, whether it's someone else, test it, try it, make a mistake. And you'll find out what the right answer is. Um, as far as the industry goes, I think this is uh, a real, it's gonna be tough for, uh, you know, the credit unions just like it is for the members and credit unions are always a reflection of what the financial makeup is of their members um we like to think sometimes it's uh, and it is a ba basically a symbiotic relationship where if the credit uh we like to think the credit union is doing well and the members are doing well it's more, more likely if the members are doing well the credit union is going to be doing well and um, if we just thought of ourselves as another financial institution that just, you know, we're just a commodity, um, we probably um, sucker from that type of attitude. But we are basically here for our members and their success means our success. I do believe wholeheartedly of playing the long game, not the short game. 
And the long game to me is member and membership value. So if you're financially able, meaning if you have sufficient capital, you got to stick to your mission and you got to stick to your purpose. And don't over-engineer your financials for 2021 performance because you're going to rob the future if you do that. So my advice would be, you know, if you can, you get, play the long game, don't play the short game. And it's so easy for people to worry about the short game. Now, honestly, if your capital is under extreme stress, you got to play the short game. I get that. But, you know, still, if you're between 8 and 9%, you got to look at the value and really focus on that and make sure that you're not really robbing Peter to pay Paul for one year's um, worth of performance. Thank you also to Deborah, Stephen, Tony, Jeff, Joe, and Maurice once again, and of course, Renee as the voice that energized our focus there in the beginning. One thing as we transition here to our discussion groups is I loved when uh, when our, our friend Jeff Lo Castro talked about test it and try it, make a mistake, just get out there and do something, right? As we get into the different strategies on how we're going to serve our membership. And I also urge all of you, if you haven't done so already, to check out the chat, the chat window that's happening. We have a friend, Andy, out there. One of the things that he said, he had a very uh, incredible point in talking about the discussions that everyone's bringing back. And he said, we have to remember that the humans we serve and guide and help every day, it is human beings after all. And we can get focused on the numbers and, and be so focused on how we're hitting the metrics that we lose sight of those humans behind to those metrics. So thank you, Andy, for your thoughtful insight. And thank you to all of you that are also there in the chat providing your thoughts as well. So now is the time that we are going to head out to our breakout groups. And the way that this is going to work, I would imagine most of you at this point have done a Zoom breakout. But if for any chance that you have not, this is the way it's going to go down here on the underground. And that is you're going to automatically be randomized into a group. And so you'll be in a small group discussion. And we urge all of you to flip on your video if you have the capacity to do so. So you can engage in these small group discussions. It'll be free flowing, but you'll have about 30 minutes in order to do so. And we want to pose the, the question or thought of what are your ideas that are going to take action, ideas into action based on our discussion topics this morning. Now you'll have an automatic countdown, so you don't have to worry about time. It will automatically pull you back into the grander group, but we will ask you to designate someone in your group as a scribe of sorts that you can take some notes and bring them back to the greater group and throw them in the chat window so all of us can hear about the thoughts that you had there in your group. And then we will pick and choose and hear from different groups uh, that are out there in the discussions that they were having. So keep those discussions going. If you have a group that, uh, that you are the energizer, we urge those energizers out there in the group to, to poke and prod and ask those strategic questions of the groups and the, the people that you're with. So at this point, I'm going to wave my magic wand and we're going to head out into breakout land. See you back. Enjoy your discussions. I'm thankful that we had the opportunity to dig in and spend some time. If you uh, were a scribe or you took any notes or you have some thoughts that you wanna share, I urge you to do so in the chat, send us some thoughts, uh, share with the entire group, let us know the different things that you talked about, all those ideas that uh, into action, things that you might be doing at your own institutions. And now we get the chance to hear from a few of you and what's happening out there, maybe the discussions that you had in your different group. But I thought because, hey, we're the underground, we're doing things a little different, I would go all the way across the ocean to start us off, head all the way over to where it's dark and we're doing this after hours to our friend, the CEO of Serve and Protect Credit Union in the United Kingdom, Mr. Paul Norgrove. Thank you for joining us. Will you give us some thoughts? That's what uh, happened in your group discussions. Why, thank you. I, do, I didn't want to thank you for the introduction. I didn't want to ruin uh, Jerry's thunder. Jerry was scribing for us. I'm sure he's going to post it to the chat as well. But uh, we had a blast. We talked around many, many things. I think we could have spent talking long into my evening anyway about certain things. But I think we went with the, 
there needs to be, and there is a current focus, you know, the blinding obvious that the young professionals are our future as an industry. Um, and there's some fantastic work being done at organizational level, association level. Um, and that's really, really exciting. Um, the, our core, core focus at the moment was sort of DEI initiatives, diversity. And, you know, it was a real shame that it probably check a, uh, took a, a reality check to, for it to reinvigorate that, whether it be, you know, George Floyd or, or some of the other things that have, have caused controversy and debate, but at least it's brought it to the, the fold, which is great. Um, some wonderful stuff on our employees are the biggest asset to us as a movement and the need to look after their wellness as well as our members and to listen to them. I learned some amazing stuff about employee resource groups and business resource groups. Um, and then finishing on that wellness is our core priority for everybody throughout the organizations. And last but not least, my favorite, which was um, remembering our why that this year, if it did anything, it remembered why we are here and our mission. And there was some great, uh, discussions on, on that. Well, that's you guys covered a lot in the time that you had together, and I think that the focus on the employees, as you mentioned, is such an important, important note and something that all of us have, were reminded of in the last year. So, thank you for that, and thank you for being here, as well as all of uh, our friends and colleagues from other countries that are joining us here on the underground. I appreciate you. I'd like to head out now to my friend Amber Harson, who is the CEO of Prodigy. And you're here, and you always have the, the most amazing voice. And I want to hear what you've got to say. What happened today? What happened in your group? Thoughts? Uh, we honestly had some really similar conver conversations to Paul and his team. Um, I do want to give a special shout out to uh, Roxana. She actually um, led with a great deal of vulnerability today and brought up a controversial statement uh, and conversation for us when she broached the topic that as a non-executive or CEO, uh, her perspective on what we needed to do and to do a better job of as executives within the industry was really listening to our staff that are working with those frontline members and also recognizing that our staff are our members and what are they experiencing in their day-to-day -day lives where we can come in and fill a void for them that may also fill that void for uh, the credit union members that we ultimately serve. And, and that really dovetailed into many conversations for us of great ideas that credit unions or organizations within our group um, came up with you know, things like partnering with other uh, financial institutions in your area, and then partnering with the Urban League, League like Steve Staff and his team have done to determine what the underbanked and underserved communities in their area are really looking for when it comes to well-being and financial well-being. And um, how do they again come in and actually walk the talk of servicing those particular member groups? We talked about, you know, things like we give all this stuff away to our members for scholarships and financial assistance, but we make our employees ineligible for that. And should we really be doing that? Is that really how we help our employees become self-sustaining and, um, again, experience their own well-being or financial well-being while they're under our roofs, uh, you know, living and, and helping us to serve these members the way that we do? So really, we, we took away the biggest thing for us is how important it was really going to be to listen to our frontline staff as part of that voice of the membership and making sure that they represent the communities that we serve as well. And that's excellent. Thank you so much for that. And starting off, even the point that you made about our employees are our members is, is an important one as well. And uh, everything that you guys talked about in your group, I think there's going to be a lot of crossover that we had in all of our groups because a lot of these things that were brought up in the underground today are things that all of us have been have been top of mind, have been important throughout the last year in each of our institutions, whether it's through businesses like yours, Amber, in supporting institutions, those of us in the vendor capacity, QSO capacity, and then those of us that are serving members directly um, in our credit unions. There's a lot of ideas and action that are coming through the chat window 
window as well, talking about warehousing or member financial wellness strategies or sharing those. People talking about employee resource groups, as Paul brought up uh, in the discussions that they had about being there for employees or employee assistance programs, being creative with some of our benefits like P PTO days or, or offering extended abilities through, to serve for health, um, talking about leadership exchange or other ways that we can connect with other humans as professionals in this industry. Talked about critical things like taking care of the people that are support, that we need to support in our lives, whether it's our kids or whether it's our parents and those of us that are caretakers within the home. And there's so many amazing things. So keep that up. Keep uh, putting things into the chat for what the, you talked about in each of your groups. Now, I'd like to head out to one of the, the godfathers of purpose that's here in this industry that's been around and industry is a partner of the underground with CUNA Mutual Group. Gary, can I, can I throw the mic to you? What are some things that you guys discussed? Sure, absolutely. Thanks so much, Brandy. And I was in Paul's group, so I will, I will not uh, repeat different things that are specific things he said, but I'll just cover it briefly. We talked about young professionals as our future. We talked about diversity as a core value, employees as our number one asset, wellness as a critical priority, and then remembering our why. Just a couple of quick hammer points I, would, I took notes on. I probably came up with six or seven things that the group all just brainstormed and popcorned around with specific ideas and action in each of those areas. A couple of things I would quickly talk about on the young professionals. Think about, Brandy, in the last year, how many young people joined our movement? as new employees, the first career of their lives, and they joined in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, some of them talked about folks, uh, a lot of these young professionals are in their parents' homes or in a bedroom or in, in, you know, with roommates and joining an organization called the Credit Union Movement. What is that like? And what kinds of opportunities are there for young professionals to engage and, and catch the bug, the credit union bug that so many of us caught all these years ago? How do we do that to make sure and bring them into the movement? And so many of the credit unions and organizations in our group talked about ways they're engaging them. And a lot of that was to get the young professionals to drive what their specific needs are. Uh, let them drive the agenda, let them drive uh, the connections. And we talked about the White Cups vision from the World Council of 10,000 strong, right? So it's not just young professionals in our communities and our credit unions, but globally as well. That was a really critical one. The other piece I would add real quick, Brandy, when we talked about exploring our why, one of the credit unions said that they talk every time they're with their employees or with their board or talking in the community, they remember their why. And here's their statement. We value experiences so that we can support our neighbors on their journey and talking about ways that they do that very practically and very tactically to support one another in that, in that journey. And the last piece I would mention, Brandy, is the community involvement, how important it is for our organizations, our credit unions and our organizations to support the community needs that we have. One example, somebody, uh, one of the credit unions here in Wisconsin provided um, school supplies and backpacks and materials for over 4,000 homeless students in one large school district outside of Milwaukee. And that's something very practical and tactical as far as taking an idea of supporting one another um, out into the community directly. So again, lots and lots of great, fantastic ideas from the group. I love one that you brought, you looped it back into the global. So thank you for that. You know, 10,000 straw with Y cup. That was excellent. Great points. And uh, really thought provoking the idea of someone entering credit union land, entering the job market, a new position in the middle of this pandemic and never connecting with their, their, their bosses potentially. Right. And never having the chance to make that human connection or having that just shift and not having the normal onboarding process that we're all used to. So excellent points. Thank you so much. Now, I want to throw this out to another friend that's out here at, because she was nominated by other people in her group. So I was getting side messages saying, you have to call on this person. But this is the ultimate put you on the spot. So I'm hoping my friend Samantha Paxson will step up and say, hey, uh, share some of the things that are happening in your group. Samantha, oh, what happened? What's the, what'd you talk about? We have such a good team. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't know I was going to be nominated, but it's it's lovely to speak with all of you and to see so many of so many friends out there. Um, I put this in the chat, but we really keyed in on that whole um, 
poll question where we saw 31% of respondents saying that the financial viability of credit unions is something that they're being really thoughtful about. And the other, um, the other 31% was that was equal to that was really serving the underserved. And we talked about the discussions that happen inside a credit union on where we invest and how we make those decisions and how we really look. We had a wonderful um, CFO in our midst, um, Justin from Azuma, talking about how it, it's so hard to kind of uh, focus on the data that we have that helps us drive that, the, that those kinds of decisions that help us really think about being an active part of our members' lives and not just think about building out branches and the, the, uh, the comfort of tradition uh, that we kind of feel so good about doing every day. We need to be thinking about what our members are needing and bringing ourselves to them instead of relying on members coming to us within the traditional ways that we've been serving them. We talked about Frank Diekman putting out, um, he put out two articles this past year that showed that the service model of credit unions was not working, that we were falling behind banks. And it's because we're not really meeting members where they are. We're not designing our credit unions to uh, be almost liquid in the way that we're engaging and creating such fluidity in um, the type of service model that members expect. Co-op just did its own proprietary um, research with EY um, among credit union members and their, their primary financial relationship, current credit union members, um, where uh, was PayPal. <laughs> so it's because technology companies are making it so easy to have members engage and be really active in the things that they need to do day to day. And we all agree that it's hard when we're looking at our financial lag metrics, how do we see um, the kind of the long-term growth, exactly what Aaron Mendez talked about. So we, we talked about some of those decisions and how we can really look at our data um, to help inform how our members are behaving and how we can really put the member at the center of everything that we do to help drive our long-term growth. So great discussion, lots of spirit, and really ways that credit unions can collaborate in order to invest and drive growth. So really meaty discussion. What a wonderful way to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Samantha, for being here. Thank you to Co-op and thank you for the discussions that you guys had. And thank you to Marquita for sending me some side messages uh, and putting you and putting you out there. All right, Sue, I'm turning it back over to you. Tell us, it, bring it all back together for the underground. Excellent work here in the last, uh, in the last couple hours. Amazing discussions, they're continuing on in the chat. How do we bring it all back together? What's your ideas into action? Well, thank you very much, Brandy. Thank you to everybody that contributed. I want to do just a minute of a thank you to the, the, um, the speakers. I see many of them here. I know they had the conversations with you in groups. And I was um, lucky enough to spend 30 minutes with them talking about these subjects in deeper dives. And the points that we brought together in our quick recap were to tell a story. And that story we wanted to tell is that we've got a blending of the lines happening in our world today. Our members, our employees are faced with so many different areas in their lives. And so they may still be employed, but what about their families? What about their parents? I mean, we've just got this whole family connection right now that we need to do. And so you heard about ending poverty. You heard about the ideas of a, a a university dedicated to serving our African-American communities and, and the whole wellness and the idea, let's think of it differently. Um, I think we've looked at financial literacy in, in some ways. Now we have to look at wellness and, and our employees are members and they are also faced with all of these dilemmas every day. So on a positive note, I hope that the message that came out to everybody was hope. Credit unions are the answer. There is no better time than our time now to demonstrate that. But as board members, as executives, we have to drill down. We have to 
get off the stage and get our, our hands dirty. And I know that it's been a tough time to do that, but I please, I would welcome and encourage everybody here to do that. And I wanna to say to our, our wonderful partners that help us put the underground together, many of them are committed to the underground voice. They're committed to, um, to bringing a message out there and having thought leaders. And so, you know, to Kenny Mitchell as our presenting um, partner, who's also doing some drill down work with us, to Alchemy, to Balance, <coughs> excuse me, to Co-op, Sea Solutions, Prodigy, Saratech, our friends at World Council and your marketing company, all of you help us bring this voice. And so what I would say to everybody, because we had quite a few new people here today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's keep the voice going. On July 13th, we'll be having a collision with our international friends. You'll be getting more information about that. And on October 28th, we are in Vegas in person and we are gonna rock and roll. And if anything changes on that, I'm, home, I'm, I'm throwing a party anyway, folks. We'll just have, you know, unique masks, but I'm ready. So we'll be doing that. And I would just say to everybody, go look at the chats. We'll be coming out with white papers. We're announcing some intellectual content, but more importantly, use your voices. Stand up for more than just the credit union philosophy. Stand up for the people that you know you can make a difference to every day, right now. As, um, as Cynthia said, we've got suicide. We have issues out there. So I just wanna encourage everybody to be there. And now I want to turn it over to uh, wrap this up. So I will see you in July. And Zach, will you do our closing? My name is James. You said you want to change the future? Well, here I am. How's that for a blinding flash of the obvious? I will be your host for the next Underground. We are the future. We are the future! We are the world. See you in July. <laughs>